You're listening to Three Kitchens Podcast, hosted by Heather Dyer and Erin Walker. We're on a mission to inspire home cooks like us to try new recipes and make good food. Well, hello there. Welcome to Three Kitchens Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Heather. I'm Erin. And we're back. We have a fun guest today. We are talking with Jessica Formicola. And Jessica is a former psychotherapist turned food blogger, recipe creator, and cookbook author. And she's the owner of a website called Savory Experiments dot com that's right which is kind of all those things in one place yeah so we invited her here today to tell us about her cooking philosophy and how she ended up switching her life around and changing her career into one of food and home cooking yeah it's interesting it's always interesting to hear how people come into this sort of thing without having been a formally trained chef or cook or any of those kinds of things yeah so we always like hearing those stories and yeah we love other home cooks that are out there trying to get everyone into their kitchen and make cooking fun yeah exactly we kind of have a similar mission and um, we had a fun chat with jessica and we hope you enjoy this interview and then hang around straight through to the end because we'll be back after our chat with jessica to talk a little bit more just the two of us <laughs> Because that's what we do around here. With us. It's real fun. <laughs> so welcome, Jessica. We're really happy to have you here with us today. Thank you for having me. You uh, have a inter- little bit of an interesting background because you went from being a psychotherapist to a food blogger, writer, cookbook author. <laughs> this is a, quite a shift, or it sounds like quite a shift. Can you tell us a little bit about why and how that came about? Yeah, I mean, if you had told me even 10 years ago that this is what I'd be doing full time, I would have told you, you were full of it. Um, So it's pretty crazy for me too. It just kind of naturally (laughs) happened. So I was the director of an outpatient psychiatry program at a hospital. I was a college professor and I worked in prisons. Oh, wow. So I I loved it. I loved working with people. I loved working with kids. I loved teaching, but um, well, it's kind of twofold. So it's fertility treatment. Plus also we come from big Italian backgrounds and we don't have any family in the area and we were used to big Sunday dinners. So as part of my self-care time, we started to host Sunday dinners at our house, family style. Nice. These were big gatherings every Sunday at our house. And I loved it. I don't know if this was dumb on my part or not. I'd take these opportunities to try new recipes, which now Ooh. as a recipe developer, not smart, not smart <laughs> at all. But um, we always kind of had this motto, like if it sucks, we'll just order a pizza. So uh, I try out all these new recipes, but I am terrible at following recipes. I modify and customize and taste and change it. And I wouldn't write things down and people would ask me for the recipe pieces, I started writing them down. But it Mm -hmm. seemed like it was easier to have just one central location so that I didn't have to send emails. I had a patient no show for a session one day and I googled how to start a blog. And that is how it started. They'd share them with their friends. And I distinctly remember the day I came home and told my husband that 30 people I did not know, mind Mm -hmm. you, had looked at my page that day. And now we have over a million page views per month. So it just goes to show you like how the progression has gone. My process was more of an educational process. So it was more of a let's reframe cooking to be fun and enjoyable and adventurous Mm -hmm. instead of a chore. And I think that that's what kind of drew my readers to me is that I'm, I'm just an average person. And at that point in time, no kids, but now I have two small children. And that was the crux of me going full-time in food media was when my daughter was born. Wow. If you had told me all of these things were going to (laughs) happen, like I said, even 10 years ago, I would have told you you're crazy. So we just kept growing with the times and changing and being flexible. And now Savory Experiments has a staff of 17 people, including myself. And we now have three websites and um, 
all of the social medias. So it's quite the evolution. Mm -hmm. I find it really fascinating. I'm always really interested to hear how people end up in Mm -hmm. food as a business. You don't have to be a professional chef who then turns to TV. You know, it kind of used to be the way, right? And it's, I think it's so fun and interesting. There's so many things you can do other than being a professional chef. I love that it comes from sharing food and creating community around it. We think that that's so important with food and that's so much of what we love to do with this podcast. So it's fantastic to have you here today to to share your story of doing that. So you have a philosophy you call the five S's and we thought this would really be interesting to other home cooks who are the people who listen to us. So why don't you tell us where that came from and um, what are the five S's? I started realizing I just like good food at home, Mm -hmm. but I don't have a lot of time. I need to be able to make good food with like my regular local grocery store or Walmart and still have it taste great. And I was already talking about what then was the four S's and we just added a fifth S and that's uh, the use of sauces, seasonings, salt, and swaps and swaps or substitutions. And then we added the fifth one, which is the senses and just using your five senses. When you look at a professional menu at a restaurant, most meals come with a sauce. The difference between a restaurant meal and what you're cooking at home is often salt, as long as you use the right kind of salt for the right recipe. And then seasonings, obviously, and we're talking fresh herbs and also spices. So I I always talk about this and my mother hates it. I found a spice bottle from McCormick that was in her spice cabinet from 1978. (laughs) Mom, this is no good anymore. Right. So it's like (laughs) seasonings and spices go bad. And I know some, she's not the only one and maybe it's not 1978, but even if it's past six months, you're not getting the full amplified flavor from spices and seasonings. Talking about that and how we can use them, but then also swaps and substitutes. So I recognize not everybody's going to have access to some of the ingredients we use, or maybe it just doesn't taste good to them. Like cilantro tastes like certain dirt and soap to some people. (laughs) So what we do is we add in all of these different swaps of like ways that you can say, okay, well, you don't have to use ground beef. You can use ground turkey. You can use venison. You can use chicken. We can swap this up. We can use rice cauliflower. We could use broccoli as a base, you know, zoodles, like all these different things of ways to say, okay, let's figure out how to make this a good meal for you and your family. And we talk about the five senses while we're cooking and things like we obviously eat with our eyes before we even taste a meal Mm. or a chef that can hear the change Mm. on a sear of a steak in a cast iron pan. And then obviously taste and touch. What does this feel like? Not just on our fingers, but what's the mouth feel? Is it dense? Is it soft? Is it fluffy? Is it aerated? You know, all these different words that we can use so that also the home cook knows if they're doing it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are our five S's that we try to incorporate into every single recipe we put out there to really help people gain confidence in the kitchen, gain confidence in their cooking. Oh, I really love how you added in the senses to the cooking, those are the same things that we have really, yeah, like tuned into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the writing it in the recipe, as you've Mm -hmm. said, is it must be such a challenge. It's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All of this added information is in the body of the blog post, that thing that most people scroll past this is where it's all located. And then also with the cookbook, the cookbook was challenging. My cookbook was twice as long as the actual published version because my editor was like, you have too much information. I was like, but I don't think there's enough. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think, I think we need more. So why don't we talk a bit about your cookbook? How did that come about? Well, I worked with um, Certified Angus Beef Brand. It's a brand that only employs family-owned and run cattle ranches in the U.S. that take pride and respect in the land that they're ranching and the animals that they're raising and the quality of animal that they're raising. Beef had always been kind of close to me, and I had been working with a literary agent, and The publisher story had done a book previously for chicken and they were searching for an author to do beef. And we were able to come up with a a book that I was happy with. For instance, the whole first chapter that's about cuts of beef and best way to see how to actually brown ground beef. 
it was a match that really worked for everybody, but they needed it fast. They needed a turnaround in 90 days for my initial manuscript. And it was over Thanksgiving and Christmas. So I literally (laughs) dropped everything. (laughs) I know it's crazy. We ate nothing but beef for 90 days. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I was going to say, how did you have time to like test all these recipes and everything? Well, we ate beef for every meal. We had a lot of frozen beef and everybody that lives around me had beef. Yeah. And I actually preferred to have not professional chefs and cooks do mm. the recipe testing. Because in my head, if my Aunt Donna, who doesn't cook, can make this, then the, then the instructions are good. Yeah. yeah. So I had this great support and community around me to do it. And then we kind of went on a beef detox for a couple of months afterwards. <laughs> and from beginning to end, it was about a year and a half. So it's crazy to think that only three months of it were actually spent recipe testing, but mm. but that's just how it works. So much of like what I really appreciate about a cookbook when I go out to buy one is having the stuff that is not a recipe, the things that educate you on how to cook with an ingredient or how to buy an ingredient or background information that you need before you jump into cooking something that it's so nice to have. The cuts, as you mentioned, were really important because... Mm. It's not always called the same thing everywhere you go. What's uh, an alternate, either a different name for essentially the same cut or a different cut that will give me the same result? You know, maybe I've Mm -hmm. done that one. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that's the one I see on sale at the store that day, you know? So I think that's really helpful information. We choose stuff that has those nuggets of information because the goal here is to make confident comfortable cooks that will be able to use this information, not just with our recipes, but with any recipe they make on down the line. You know, getting out of your comfort zone is what makes you a better home cook too. I mean, sometimes it fails, but sometimes Mm -hmm. you find out like really cool things and flavor combos. And so there are definitely elements that you don't want to go overboard on. We're huge proponents of salts just to bring out natural flavors, but we also Mm -hmm. talk about how to then fix it if it goes wrong. Like if something's too salty, How do we go about balancing that? How do we add an acid or a sweetness to balance the salty? Or do we just need to dilute it? Do we just need to add more broth or water or wine or something else to that? So again, it's it's all that knowledge base and, and figuring it out things like there's just so many variables, but I do try to help troubleshoot that. And I, I don't mind at all. And then usually if it's something like that, I'll actually add into the recipe post, Hey, if you have trouble with this, why didn't the sauce thicken? My sauce was too thin. My sauce was too thick. Here's how to fix it. Sometimes it's just the brand of ingredient you use, Mm. like some, Mm -hmm. like, or even butters. Butters have different water contents in them. So Mm -hmm. sometimes you need to add that in there so people don't fail. So yeah, there those are take those are good learning moments for me and and to add into those blog posts for others. I want to go back quickly to something you said earlier, and it's in your book about browning ground beef. So you said a lot of people do it wrong. Can you explain Mm -hmm. (laughs) what are we doing wrong? Of course, and this goes for ground chicken, ground turkey, all these ground meat. It has a lot of surface space, but that also means that there's a lot of surface space for all of the moisture that's inside of it to evaporate out. And what ends up happening is folks actually don't cook it on high enough heat. And it ends up being kind of gray, chewy, and rubbery because all the moisture and and flavor has now evaporated out of it. So the correct way to do this is to have a really high, high, high heat pan. And I use cast iron a lot because then I don't need additional oils. You do, if you're using nonstick pan or a stainless steel pan, you'll need a little bit of a high smoke point oil so it doesn't burn. Get it super, super hot before you add the meat. The hotter the pan the less likely it is for the meat to stick. They're flipping things a little too early. Things won't stick if they're at a proper heat and they'll actually start to loosen as they get hotter. But I'm digressing now. So (laughs) this is, I get all excited talking about browning things. (laughs) No, you're talking to the right people here. (laughs) Yeah. So ground beef. So I get a steaming, steaming hot pan and I add it as the whole brick and I let it sit there. Do not touch it. If you touch it, the browning is going to stop. It needs to have meat in contact with hot pan. And when you start to smell it and you start to see, you know, the sizzle, it's going to have some evaporation. That's normal. You're going to have some steam. You know, you can peek under a little edge to see if it's browning. I want it to brown. I want a nice brown char that is not burnt. There's a difference between brown and char and burnt. And that's when you flip it. 
and I flip it as a whole big piece too. So I flip it over, I brown the other side, because if you break it up as you put it in, now some pieces will be brown, other pieces Mm. will still be raw the ground beef separator things. Have you seen those? No. So no. It's, it's a tool. Uh-oh, new tools, Erin. Yeah, it's cheap. Don't worry, it's like eight bucks. <laughs> They're usually cast iron or, or some sort of metal. And again, I can very evenly mash up the meat so that I'm getting an even breaking. So now I've got even pieces of crumbled meat too. And I flip it in sections. All of this is just to make sure that it's evenly browned. And I want that char on it. I don't want it to be gray. I'd rather it be a brownish black than a gray. And then you take it out. Now you're searing in all those juices. It's spending less time in the pan, so there's less evaporation. And the browning creates an acid on the meat, which chemically changes the flavor to taste better and more beefy. And that works with any kind of ground meat. One of the first things years ago when I started cooking... Um, Mm -hmm. that I learned was put it in that hot pan and don't touch it. And I have to say that was like the scariest thing. I remember learning how to brown chicken breasts and reading this in a cookbook that I had. And I remember standing there with my hands back, looking at it, being like, I know I'm not supposed to touch it, but I really want to touch it. Like, (laughs) just want to check on it. I just want to peek. You have to have faith in it. You have to just let it go. And patience. And patience. (laughs) I was reading the thing about ground beef and because I think ground beef is one of those things you never think about browning. And the soaring prices of groceries right now from everything basic from milk to eggs and butter. Mm -hmm. And and when we're talking about proteins, ground beef is one of the ones that you can still get at a relatively cheap rate. And Mm -hmm. one pound of ground beef I can use for an entire one dish meal for my family, like done. Like Yeah. And as you mentioned, there's a benefit not just in quality, but to shop from local producers and people that are in, and and also the money you're spending then, even if it's not cheaper, it's staying in your community and you're helping out your neighbors too, which is always great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to chat quickly about sauce. It's one of your S's and you have a few recipes in the book. And it seems to me that it's kind of like some really basic sauces that you could use as a starting point. Very much so. I think of things like aioli. Aioli, guys, it's just like fancy mayonnaise. If you start with just a little bit of mayo, and sometimes I don't use mayo, I actually will swap that out with plain Greek yogurt oh. or sour cream. And um, it still has a little bit of tang. But um, yeah, I can take that and I always have it on hand and add whatever else I have, dried spices, fresh herbs, a little bit of citrus, some zest, things like that, and usually come up with something that will complement a meal. It really, the <laughs> amount of condiments that my family has is insane, mm-hmm. but we don't, we don't have any meal without a sauce, but they're easy to pair. Mm-hmm. If I've got the base for an aioli or I have the base for a butter sauce, I can generally use some of the same elements from whatever it is I cooked in the sauce to help it complement whatever it is I'm making. Um, so you mentioned you ha- you're from an Italian family. Your background is obviously Italian. Is that your favorite go-to type of like cuisine or what would you say is your, like if you had to pick one for the rest of your life? I think Italian probably would be my pick, but only because of the fact that there's so many different types of Italian. It's not all just, mm. you know, spaghetti and meatballs. If we're going Southern Italy, we're talking about fresh fish and citrus and a lot of fruits and, mm. and, and seafood. And if we're going Northern with more risottos and if we're going Roma, we're going with pastas and, and things along those lines. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. This has been a lot of fun and really informative. I feel like I, even though my Zoom kicked me out during the ground beef discussion, <laughs> I'm going to go back and listen to that because <laughs> I missed part of it. Um, I, th- I feel like we've learned lots of things and I hope that our listeners have also. And please tell everybody where to find you and all your recipes and how to get their hands on your book. So everything is available at savoryexperiments.com. From there, you can go to our two other websites, which is My Sauce Recipes because we like, we like keeping it saucy over here and best dessert recipes, which is dessert recipes for very lazy cooks, which is, Mm. I'm not, I'm much more of a savory cook than I am a baker. So it's, it's recipes for, for lazy bakers and all of our social media handles. You can, you can get to from savoryexperiments.com. The book is available on Amazon. It's called beef it up. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. Any place books are sold. And there is an entire video on how to properly ground 
uh, brown ground beef on YouTube on our cooking channel. So if you need to uh, go back and get a refresher on that for me with visuals, you are more than welcome to do so. Wonderful. That is so good. I think we'll have to link to that in the show notes because we'll link to all the things. All the things. Yeah. It's so great to hear from a fellow home cook who's who's going out there and sharing all this with everyone so that we can create better home cooks and better food at home. It's great. I hope it inspires somebody to try something new tonight. Right? Oh, for sure it will. Hey, Erin, let's take a quick break to tell the listener all about our website. I really love that if you want to hear our story about these recipes, you can tune into us. But when you want to make them, they're just a click away. No scrolling. Just get right to it. Exactly. Usually at the end of a recipe, we give you a few ways to zhuzh it up. Either a way to serve it, a way to modify it, tips for how we like to eat it. And, of course, all of our episodes, including the Speakeasy bonus episodes and the drink recipes, it's all on there. So visit us over at threekitchenspodcast.com. Well, that was really fun talking with Jessica, and we would like to touch on her five S's a little bit more and uh, give you some back catalog content from us. (laughs) Tongue twister. (laughs) So you can go back and play and explore. So... I think the easiest one to talk about might be salt Mm -hmm. because the salted lemons have become (laughs) like a new category of salt. Yeah. Yeah. You know that salt preserved lemons was one of our, the first discoveries we kind of made that none of us had tried before. And we thought we're like, wow, this is so awesome. And we've used them in a ton of things. So it just goes to show that salt does not necessarily just need to be that little rock, that grain of (laughs) whiteness. <laughs> I'm really doing a great job of explaining this. Heather, give us a visual description of salt, <laughs> salt please. Shaker. <laughs> you just heard it here. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even repeat it. Um, salt comes in different forms. Aaron discovered the salt of anchovies mm. in uh, Caesar salad dressing. Yeah. If you think of something like capers. Oh, or- yeah. And I know, like, I always like using fish sauce, which sounds terrible. (laughs) It sounds like it wouldn't go with a lot of things, but it actually Mm. really enhances the flavor of lots of recipes. Same thing with something like soy sauce Mm. that is salty with a different flavor. It's not just the salt. Yeah. So there's lots of different ways to incorporate salt into a recipe that is not just adding that salt to your plate. Sometimes... You think of it as just having that salt shaker on the table, but yeah. So, and I really like the tip too, of just at the end, always make sure that you test it and adjust that salt to where the level should be. So that's always a good reminder. Mm -hmm. And if you are incorporating salt or salty ingredients throughout the recipe, do the same thing. Taste it as you go to make sure you're not adding too much. And then I think Jessica mentioned a few ideas about like, Mm. if you have found you've over salted your soup, maybe you can add more broth or water to balance it out. Or maybe you need to balance it with acid. I liked her suggestion of wine because Mm -hmm. that's such a good, it's got good flavor in it. It goes with like everything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. it dilutes that saltiness for you yeah what s do you want to talk about heather well i think my favorite is probably the swaps swaps oh. and substitutions because I've... i just that's the way i cook as i said <laughs> earlier i was gonna say that's like your that's cooking fine. philosophy is swaps <laughs> my philosophy is just wing it <laughs> Um, but that's what swaps and substitutions often are about. It's Mm -hmm. if, if you read a recipe and you think, oh, this sounds really good. Oh, except that one. I don't like that thing. So I'm not going to make this recipe. Hang on. (laughs) Maybe there's a substitution. Maybe you can swap it for something. You often see this. If you ever read, I like to read, I don't read the blog post, but I read the comments often on recipes. Yes. Yes. I find those really helpful. Yeah. To see what other people did and what 
questions they had. And, and you'll see that all the time where someone says, oh, I can't eat this or I don't like that. What can I substitute it with? And then people chime in with like, mm-hmm. oh, have you tried this? And what about that? And you could turn it into something completely different that's exactly what you want to eat. Yeah, it's good to remember that when you scroll down a recipe, and I am the guiltiest for this, is when I see something that I'm like, oh, this has Miracle Whip in it. <laughs> <laughs> not touching that and yeah. you'll be like yeah but you can use mayonnaise instead and I'll be like oh right <laughs> I often substitute and swap out dairy items for mm. a type of like a different dairy that I know I can digest right or or no dairy uh, like if I see something with heavy cream I'll try to think of ways to put sour cream mm-hmm. or yogurt instead because I know those are more easily digestible for me and you know what they make a good substitution or coconut milk too mm-hmm. I, I do the sour cream one often if I see heavy cream and I'm like mm, I'll put in sour cream instead yeah it's a bit different flavor it's got that kind of zing to yeah. it I think or if like say you're making a soup and you want to thicken it and you don't ha- like maybe you don't buy cream regularly or you're out of sour cream or whatever Take some of the soup out a little bit and blend it so it's creamed and then put that blended soup into your soup. I'm giving you a face because I'm like, me a for face. real? Oh, I've <laughs> never done that before. And I've I thought never we were thought like, of what, it before. I wasn't, talking, I wasn't giving you the crazy eyes. I was giving oh, you okay. the, that's crazy. I've never thought of that before. <laughs> I, w- I don't know how well it would work to blend up something with meat in it, but maybe if it does have meat in it, you can just pick out, like, don't put the chunks of meat when you blend it. Just blend the vegetable and broth. Yeah. Um, So it's creamy and thick and then put it back in and it helps thicken up your soup. Oh, that is a really good one to do. I like that. You know, sometimes when I don't want to take out or fry up ground beef, I sometimes substitute lentils in place of ground beef. Oh. And so I have made lentil nachos and I think it is just as good. Oh, that sounds good. I've never tried that. And I don't know. I like the the texture in the lentils, especially on nachos. And like when you get that cheese mixed in there and Mm. you do a really good melt on it. Personally, I like my lentil nachos better than the ground beef nachos. (laughs) Mm, That's a great idea. (laughs) So you can you can always kind of, you know, think about different ways to sub out that meat. If you don't want to do the meat, there are so many good options. Or if you have picky kids or, you know, allergies or something and you have to swap something out, just Get creative and really think about what is something I do like or that person can eat Mm -hmm. and can it work the same way? Like, does it cook up the same way? Or if I just cook it a bit differently and add it in, um, would it work? I think my favorite swap is because I don't keep breadcrumbs on hand using oats in place of breadcrumbs for breading and frying things. Um, If you're making a meat mixture and you need it in there to thicken up like your burgers or meatballs or whatever, that's one of my favorites. Mm. Because if you get the gluten-free oats, boom, all your recipes (laughs) are gluten-free now. Um. And that can be so challenging sometimes when Mm -hmm. you're not used to cooking gluten-free. And so Mm -hmm. having that as my backup lot for breadcrumbs always makes me so excited. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Okay, should we talk sauces? This is going to be hard to like narrow down Mm -hmm. what sauces I like the best. (laughs) I have a sauce problem. This is what I've realized because now that I've stopped buying condiments and I've started making more condiments, it's really just a shift in my fridge now from all the bottled sauces to all the jars in my fridge. And I mentioned at one point that my poor child thought that one jar was simple syrup but instead it was chicken broth and he put it in his drink (laughs) (laughs) this is the problem when you have too many sauces in your fridge you have to label the jars oh no i don't have time for that (laughs) (laughs) it's a much more fun experiment to be like what's in the mystery jar oh no okay i did a lot of thinking about this one to try and figure out what i think my favorite sauce is i think I have settled on amba sauce. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you knew I was going to say that. (laughs) I just can't live without it. Amba sauce is a Middle Eastern mango mustard kind of, you simmer down the mango, yeah, with sumac and 
I can't even remember. You've made it more recently than I. Well, I have made it kind of recently, but I forget what else went in there. The but thing it's... is, is I make a big batch and then I oh freeze it. And then I just take out a cup at a time. I can just put it on yeah. everything all the time. We first had it in a, for an episode on a sabiq, which is mm-hmm. a sandwich in a pita with roasted eggplant and hummus and tahini sauce and amba sauce, like all the yummy things. Yeah. And we fell in love with amba sauce. I fry up an egg. I toss it into a nan bread that I've toasted that's got hummus and amba sauce and some fresh chopped tomatoes and cucumbers that I've just salted and seasoned with uh, lemon juice. It is just like my favorite quick go-to lunch. It just gives me all the feels. And I love to make chicken fingers and dip Mm. it in there. And you made a mango sauce when you made pakoras. But you could use oh, this like stuff a chutney. too. Oh, yeah. Like... This is a similar, yeah, it's a similar type of sauce because it's thick and chunky. Yeah. Um, you can scoop it up really easily with tortilla chips or oh, pita chips. Yes. It really is delicious. Good call. <laughs> Canva sauce. Recipes on the website. <laughs> Everybody go make it. Don't even think about it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> What's... I I stole the amber sauce, so I'm gonna have to ask you. What's your second favorite sauce? I have not. I know the thought that you did. Um, okay, some options. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, options are good. So I wrote down from the website: bacon jam, chimichurri, salsa verde, tomato onion chutney, the rose sauce. Those were the oh things God. that I put down from there. How can you even pick from? I know. This is the thing. Like, as I look at that, when I was like, my favorite sauce is, it was like... And you know what else we should add to that list? Oh, Alabama white sauce. (gasps) That's my new favorite. I just Um, made chicken this week again, mm. just so that I could have more of it. (laughs) So delicious. All of those sauces. And a good old nak cham. I'm thinking of, remember when we had um, Bonsio? Yeah. And we wrapped it all up in like with the herbs and the um, rice paper and like dipped it in the nak cham. Oh my God. So good. So and so simple. I am so jumping on some knock. Oh yes. Okay. The mint Secret was the ingredient. thing in there that I was like, really mint? I can't see how this is gonna work. And yes, yes, a thousand times yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's another episode. Everybody, go look the, up the bonseo. Well, that goes nicely into seasoning with fresh herbs. Mm. Because mm. nothing beats that mint in there. Oh, oh. yeah. So delicious. <laughs> and you just pile on any like fresh herbs that you oh, yeah. like. You're, you've, you've made this beautiful crepe. Yes. And then you pile on your fresh herbs or, or microgreens and then kind of roll it all up and dip it away. Oh, so good. We need to talk about our seasonings, which are fresh herbs. I think the best fresh herb recipe is that rotisserie oh. that you made. The beef with the with the paste, the fresh herb paste from Ryan Sanderson. Oh, yes. it was so good. Yeah. And like he said, you can make extra. So maybe it's that season in your garden and you've got a bunch of herbs. Make up. Yeah, she's got her hand up. Me. Me. <laughs> make up a bunch of that paste. It's just mixed with oil, a bunch mm-hmm. of fresh herbs and garlic, and then put it in your freezer. Yeah. And pull it out later, maybe in the fall when all your herbs are done and you want this fresh taste. Yeah. You can put it in your um, oven on whatever meat you're cooking or you can put it on the rotisserie like I did. Oh, delicious. And I think if you want to zhuzh it up, put fresh herbs with your butter. Mm. You can make like an herbed butter. And like you say, you can keep that in your freezer. And then when it's time to bring it out and it's Oh, you slice those little bits mm. off. You toss them on a, on your meat. There's nothing better than that fresh herb with your meat. We need to do a whole episode on like herb, but flavored butters. We should just do a flavored butter. We should. Think <laughs> about it. You got in there, you've got seasoning. You're probably salting yeah. to some extent. You are almost creating a sauce when that butter melts oh, all over you your steak. You can make a sauce with whatever 
drips off yes that in your pan just creates the sauce in your pan add some wine in with it or something and you've got like a delicious sauce and you're cooking with all your senses as we have yet to discuss because you're smelling it you're gonna taste it (laughs) you're listening to it sizzle away what else watching it brown i don't know (laughs) what are the other senses did i miss any yeah i liked her suggestions too just talking about when you you can take an everyday ordinary meal And just by dicing things up a little bit differently, adding that sauce in there and like plating it in a pretty way, Mm. that makes, that can take an everyday meal to something amazing. You know, sauces, seasoning, salting, swapping, and then paying attention to all five senses while you cook and when you serve. I think we can get behind that. I agree. Thank you, Jessica. And check out the video for this week because... I browned ground beef properly. Oh. Well, I think I browned ground beef properly. We'll see what Jessica has to say Mm. (laughs) when she sees it. (laughs) (laughs) So check out our social medias for that. And don't forget, you can check the show notes for all the links to Jessica's uh, website and social media. And all these recipes that we've talked about. Go check out everything. (laughs) Check it all. We've just given you so many past episodes to listen to. You can't say you don't have anything to put in your ears. Have yourselves a wonderful day. And now for the fine print. Join us over on the socials, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And on our website at threekitchenspodcast.com. Word of mouth is the number one way people find a new podcast. And remember, when you like, follow, subscribe, and leave a review, it helps more people find us. Thank you so much for listening. Like, I'm like, what's the worst that can happen? You have extra cheese? Like, I know. <laughs>